This is the Economic Club of Florida, a distinguished platform for discussion of the major national issues of the day. On today's program, Dr. Judy Monroe of the CDC Foundation on the problem of reliable data reporting in our public health system. We are not at a current state with our data systems where all the data is coming in as accurately or as timely as it should. You know, we had health departments when we started this um, pandemic that were using fax machines. Good day and welcome to the 546th in our series of distinguished speaker programs. I'm Harvey Bennett for the Economic Club of Florida. We're privileged today to have with us someone who is right in the middle of the public health dynamics of the coronavirus pandemic that has swept the United States and the world. She's Dr. Judy Monroe, MD, President and CEO of the CDC Foundation in Atlanta. Dr. Monroe, welcome. Great to be with you. Most everyone's heard of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, but fewer have heard about the CDC Foundation. Tell us, what is it and what role has it been playing in response to the coronavirus pandemic? The CDC Foundation is an independent 501c3 nonprofit that was actually created by Congress in 1992 to help advance CDC's mission to save lives, both here in the United States and around the world. So we work with CDC closely, but also with the public health system at large. And we have a mission to do not only chronic disease, infectious disease, emergency response, uh, we, we do a variety of, of things at the foundation. And we hit speed and flexibility is probably the greatest thing that we have uh, in terms of, of our capabilities that go beyond what government can do. So during the pandemic, we have been super busy right from the start. Starting in January of 2020, we activated our emergency response fund, started rallying public-private partnerships and uh, funding to help advance the mission of CDC and, and public health. Um, and we have done everything from helping folks in quarantine, uh, the homeless, uh, getting vaccines out is one of the big areas that we're focused on now. Uh, early in the response, we worked on data systems. Uh, we've hired over a thousand staff to embed them in uh, health departments. Wow. So every state health department has had CDC Foundation field staff to help surge uh, the response during during COVID, and we're about to hire more. That's terrific. You are the army behind the army. Uh, <laughs> somewhat. We're the fast army. <laughs> <laughs> now, you are a medical doctor who previously worked for the CDC itself in the domestic response to the Ebola epidemic back in 2014-2015. What do you think the public needs to be more aware of about the CDC's public health mission? So during Ebola, and I'm glad you brought that up, I have to tell you, I was inside CDC and I watched these dedicated professionals put themselves in harm's way to help protect Americans and, and the world from the Ebola uh, epidemic. I've seen that again during the COVID response. People are working 24-7. Uh, they've, they've put their hearts and souls into the science, but also then trying to translate that science into guidance that honestly every hospital across the nation uses. Uh, every health department turns to CDC for their guidance and the science that uh, is developed there. So I think for the public, I mean, they need to know that CDC uh, is working for them every single day, 24-7. You've had a very interesting life. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how it's impacted your life journey. Well, I started out with a goal of, of being a practicing physician in an underserved community. So I started out in Appalachia, uh, in rural Tennessee, practicing day-to-day uh, -day medicine in a, in a community that needed a, a physician. Um, but Along the way, I'd, I'd gotten married. My husband wanted an academic career, so I found myself going into academics at Indiana University, directing a residency program, and then got tapped on the shoulder by Mitch Daniels, the, the governor at the time of Indiana, that asked me to be his state health officer. And that was my transition into public health. But I will tell you, I had been having a growing concern and frustration practicing medicine one patient at a time because so many things coming into my office needed a community response or a community public health uh, response to be able to make a difference. You know, we started seeing childhood obesity and children failing their physical exams for sports, as an example. Uh, we have mental health issues. We have, you know, the, the uh, opioid crisis, uh, which, of course, has escalated. But there, there were just so many issues of the day that I thought, you know, I've got to answer the call if I'm being asked to, to come to the 
lead a public health agency, uh, which was a great ride. Uh, I have to tell you, working with Governor Daniels was amazing. And uh, I was there during H1N1. So, and, and actually the president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials during H1N1. So I had exposure um, and then got asked to come to CDC to, to be a deputy director uh, at that time under Dr. Tom Frieden, who was the CDC director. And not coincidentally, some of those very issues that you mentioned when you were actively practicing, the childhood obesity, the mental health issues, are some of the same topics that the CDC Foundation is taking on right now in addition to the coronavirus, right? That's correct. They, they're they still issues today, and, and sadly, the pandemic has made some of those issues worse. So we have our work cut out for us going into the future, but uh, we, we are focused on a number of priority areas at the CDC Foundation. That's terrific. Dr. Judy Monroe, thank you. Dr. Monroe is president and CEO of the CDC Foundation in Atlanta, and we certainly look forward to hearing your formal remarks and learning more about partnerships leading to a healthier world. Thank you. Now, here's Marjorie Turnbull, board member of the Economic Club of Florida, with our formal introduction. It is such a privilege to be able to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Judith Monroe, is president and CEO of the CDC Foundation. I learned of Dr. Monroe's illustrious career and contributions to public health by way of a chance phone call this summer from a fellow alum of Agnes Scott College, where I did my first two years. It turned out that this alum, Jenny Parker, is vice president for infection disease programs for the CDC Foundation. So in the course of our conversation, I admitted I had no idea the CDC had a foundation, and I said, tell me more. Hearing about their work worldwide in dealing with epidemics and pandemics, and as we were in the middle of COVID-19, it occurred to me it would be a great coup if we could get Dr. Monroe as a speaker for the Economic Club of Florida. And so she's here. She has had a sterling career, held the position of State Health Commissioner for Indiana, during which time she was elected President of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers. She subsequently joined the CDC as a Deputy Director and Director of CDC's Office of State, Tribal, Local, and Territorial Support. In these roles, she oversaw key activities and technical assistance at CDC, supporting the nation's health departments and public health system. Dr. Monroe's recognitions and honors are numerous. She currently serves on the board of directors for the Center for Global Health Initiation and for the Georgia Global Health Alliance. She's a member of the Milken Institute's Public Health Advisory Board, serves on the World Health Organization Foundation's Advisory Group, and the Advisory Council of the Pandemic Action Network. She was recently recognized by the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce with the Heroes of Global Health Award. She received the American Public Health Association's Presidential Citation for her work to improve the health and well-being of people around the world and for her commitment to future public health as a mentor to young physicians and public health students. Under her leadership, the CDC Foundation has been a frontline partner with the CDC in public health challenges and epidemics around the globe, including Zika, Ebola, H1N1, and now actively supporting the CDC response to COVID-19. Lest I leave something out, I'll let her be the one to give you the detail of everything that uh, the work of the CDC Foundation is accomplishing. I think it goes without saying that when it comes to pandemics, that with Dr. Monroe looking out for all of us, we are in good hands. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Judith Monroe, President and CEO of the CDC Foundation. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And let me just say, it is such a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. This is my first in-person talk since the pandemic started. So, so it's wonderful to be here in Tallahassee and be with you. The, um, those Zoom meetings start to wear on you after a while. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is uh, 
go ahead and let me make sure we got the slides going. Whoop, whoop. Back up here a little bit. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about partnerships because that's really what the CDC Foundation's all about and give you a background on what has been really a well-kept secret, and that is the fact that the CDC does have a foundation. Um, so we started in 1992 actually being authorized by Congress to be established as an independent 501c3 foundation, and we're an operating foundation. So we are a really different animal in the world of foundations, if you will. Um, you may not be aware, but the NIH has a foundation, uh, the, the park services, uh, you know, national parks have a foundation. So there are a number of other uh, federal agencies and federal groups that do have authorized foundations. Uh, but we're completely independent uh, of CDC. So I report as the CEO, I report to an independent board of directors, um, and we do all our own management. But we work closely uh, with CDC to try to help advance their life-saving work. Um, a little background on why a foundation for CDC. The, there were four former CDC directors that went to Congress uh, and said, you know, we really should have a foundation for CDC. And the most notable, I would say, was Bill Feige, who was CDC director during the eradication of smallpox. And historically, the only disease that we've ever eradicated has been smallpox. And the way that was done, the final mile, was really through partnerships. It took private sector, it took boots on the ground, it was really through public-private partnerships. So he felt strongly that if CDC had a foundation that could forge public-private partnerships on behalf of, of the agency, that that would, that would uh, be a really positive for, for public health. And so that's, that's what we do. Um, and I'll give you a little flavor here of, of the various uh, work we've done. So over the uh, course of the, we're in our 26th year as an operating foundation. Foundation started really small, uh, and it's been growing. Uh, in that period of time, this slide, we've provided over $1.2 billion of philanthropic private support to help augment uh, what government has been doing, although at the end of June, that's going to be $1.6 billion. Uh, so it's been a, it's been a, a very big year. Um, we've built this broad network of individuals, uh, private sector, other philanthropies. So in my, in my work, I find myself sometimes on, the, on phone calls with CEOs of startup companies all the way to, you know, talking to folks. Uh, I gave a talk to Dell, uh, all the employees of, of Dell worldwide not long ago on, on vaccines. Um, so it's, it's both small and large companies. It's philanthropies. Uh, our funding, uh, many of our programs have come from the Gates Foundation, from Bloomberg Philanthropies, but then it's small family foundations that want to do work, want to do work globally or, or locally, sometimes globally as well. So it's, it's this whole array of folks that are committed to public health. Uh, we've launched more than 1,200 programs, and that's, those are both domestically and globally, and we're probably split 50-50 in terms of our work, whether it's uh, here in the United States or around the world. And, and the result has been millions of lives uh, saved through, through a variety of programs. Um, I, my, my team put this in to uh, note the quality of, of, uh, and our stewardship. I, we, we take our work very, very seriously. And so 14 consecutive years now, we've had uh, a four-star rating, the highest uh, rating through Charity Navigator uh, for our work. So what do we do, uh, this array of programs? Um, I'm going to start with emergency response because that's been on everyone's minds and uh, every day you can't pick up a newspaper or hear anything, uh, you know, see any news uh, that you don't hear about the CDC, uh, the agency. Everyone knows uh, the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, you don't hear as much about what the foundation does, uh, although we are, we have been out there more during COVID. Um, so since January of 2020, um, and the way CDC works, when they saw the uh, coronavirus, this novel coronavirus starting to emerge from China, they activated their emergency operations center. And when CDC activates, it's an all hands on deck. It was everybody across the agency gets called uh, to serve one way or another, uh, to rotate through the emergency operations center or, or to help support the response. Um, and so they'll, they'll rotate those, those uh, opportunities and, and challenges. And then for the CDC Foundation, about five days after they had activated, we activated our emergency fund. Um, and we started making phone calls and being on webinars and talking to philanthropy and private sector about the fact that this is going to be what we think is going to be pretty big. 
and uh, there will need, be a need for the philanthropic support to come alongside government. The reason for that is speed and flexibility, um, because government just can't move. Well, government can do a lot, but it can't do everything, and it can't ever move as fast as, as philanthropy can. And so uh, some of the things that we were called upon to do, first of all, we've, we've raised to date over $297 million for the COVID response, um, and that's been growing. We've done everything from in the early parts of the, of the pandemic. If you'll remember, folks needed to be in quarantine. Uh, there were folks traveling from Wuhan, uh, China, that had no idea that they were going to be in quarantine. Some of them needed medical devices. They needed medical help. They needed housing. And, and so we stepped in and helped with some of those essential needs. Uh, we helped everything from homeless communities that uh, needed to be separated while the, while the virus was uh, uh, spreading. Uh, we've built a whole network of community-based organizations around the country to help uh, support the, the response. We were able to hire over a thousand search staff, um, and I'm going to show you a map here in a minute. And this came both through federal funding, a cooperative agreement from CDC, because we could move quickly in doing this, as well as private funding. We had private funders that said, we really want to help, help hire more nurses, doctors to, to help on the ground. Uh, we provided uh, over 8 million pieces of personal protective equipment. Because we're global, uh, I have a team that uh, they, they knew where to go in China, where the trusted sources were, because if you'll remember, some of the personal protective equipment was not, was counterfeit. So it wasn't, so we were, we were determined to get the quality uh, uh, PPE. Um, health equity program, programs, there were over 60 that we helped uh, support. And then communications. We've done a lot with communications, both national campaigns. We've worked with the Ad Council and helped uh, augment and support some of the national campaigns that you've, I'm sure you've seen on television, uh, and then local uh, uh, support for communications as well. Um, and we've partnered, uh, last I'll mention, is we partnered with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Ad Council, Business Roundtable, uh, and the DeBeaumont Foundation to help fund something that is called the Health Action Alliance. And this is actually to support businesses during uh, the COVID uh, response. And it was aimed at businesses understanding the vaccines, helping their employees get vaccinated, uh, a whole host of high quality materials that have been put on their website. They hold webinars. Uh, I think over 540 different companies of different sizes have, have uh, taken uh, uh, the, the advantage of this Health Action Alliance. Um, so that's been great work. Quickly, this shows you uh, the federally funded staff that we hired. So we, we do the recruiting, the hiring, we work with the health departments, we find out exactly what kind of uh, needs they have. So you can see in Florida, we hired 44 CDC Foundation field staff that were embedded in your health departments, uh, the state health department uh, here in Tallahassee, and then in some of the other health departments uh, that, uh, as directed by the state. Uh, but you can see across the nation how many uh, each state uh, received. We're in the process now of hiring more uh, to help support in this uh, next phase of, of the response and the recovery, uh, most importantly, which we're all celebrating, uh, certainly trying to get, get things back to, to normal. Uh, this is just a slide on the community-based organizations that we're supporting. Um, this says over 100. I think we're up to about 140 community-based organizations that either through private or federal funding, we're giving many grants to them, and then we're giving technical support. And this is really that last mile of the vaccine. You know, folks that might need access to vaccines, they might need a, a driving, they may have problems understanding where to get a vaccine, or they may need their questions answered, uh, because everybody deserves to have their questions answered if they uh, are interested in a vaccine, uh, but um, have not had an opportunity to really understand uh, these vaccines. So that takes me to global health security. This is one of our major uh, priorities at the CDC Foundation, working with CDC. Global health security really is all about preventing pandemics and, and preparing for the next threat. Uh, there are four core capacities that every country in the world should have, and that's laboratory capacity, surveillance to be able to know where diseases are popping up, uh, workforce development and emergency preparedness. Uh, we focused, prior to the pandemic, we had been asked by CDC to uh, prioritize Haiti, India, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Vietnam as countries that we would focus our attention on through the foundation, through public-private partnerships. Uh, some of this is obviously changing now uh, in the aftermath of, of the pandemic. 
The other thing that we've been quite involved in in the emergency category are hurricanes, and uh, you all, Florida's no, no stranger to hurricanes, that's for sure. Um, so as an example, after the 2017 hurricanes, CDC Foundation was asked to work uh, both in uh, Texas and Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, and one of the things, as an example, in Puerto Rico, they had been so disrupted by Hurricane Maria that vaccines were not available. So we ended up supporting and working with partners on the ground to do a, uh, across the entire island, to do a large scale vaccination campaign. Uh, we also help them with health uh, messages, uh, communications. Uh, we'll, we'll many times, uh, again, hire staff that will be embedded on the ground with the health departments to just help them be a link uh, sometimes back to CDC uh, and to other partners. But we don't only do emergencies. Um, so I wanted to give you a little flavor of the, the broad work that we do. Uh, in any given year, we probably have about 300 active programs, uh, again, both globally and uh, here in the United States. So here in the United States, one uh, program that we're, we're diving deeply into is fall prevention. Um, you know, it's billions of dollars each year. It's a number of folks, uh, you know, falls, uh, particularly in older adults, but can be younger as well, uh, falls can really disrupt your life. And I, I, I just had a colleague at the, at the foundation whose mother uh, had, um, had just overcome a, an illness and then had a fall, and that ended up actually claiming her life. It was the fall after a, a, overcoming a major uh, infectious disease. So uh, falls are serious, and so we have partnered both with CDC, they have an, a whole center for injury prevention at CDC, and partnering with some private uh, sector uh, partners uh, to help bring education to older adults uh, and caregivers about how to prevent the falls. If you can prevent it, that's, that's the highest order of anything we ever do in, in public health is, is the actual prevention. Um, and then provide key tools for the caregivers and so forth. So there's a lot on our website about this and, and on CDC's website uh, as well. Another area, and I know, uh, of course, here in Florida, drowning, I just was reading, it's up, I think, in children, 600% over last year. So folks are getting out now and they're you know, out in the swimming pools and so forth. So I just, just read that here uh, in Florida. In this case, this is a uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, partnered with us and, and they're funding uh, our understanding of drowning in Africa uh, because they that claims uh, many lives, but they didn't have the data. They didn't understand what was really happening. So a lot of our work with partners is to get the information and the data then to be able to translate that into what actions really need to take place. How do you use the resources the most uh, in, the, in the wisest uh, fashion? So uh, in this case, we've, you know, we're, we're uh, using that data then to inform public health officials and policymakers uh, in, in Africa about the problem and help assist them in prevention programs uh, uh, going forward to help mitigate that. Um, Another topic, uh, this one, we're, I, I have to tell you, I have some really passionate staff at the CDC Foundation. Uh, one, one individual that has just really taken uh, sickle cell data collection to, to heart. Um, this is a serious illness. Um, it's the most common inherited blood disorder in the United States. Um, and for folks with it, it, it may decrease your average life expectancy by a full 30 years, um, so quite serious. But we didn't have the data. We didn't really understand, especially as folks were getting older and going into adulthood. Um, and so we did a pilot project that was privately funded in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and in uh, Los Angeles. And from that data that was collected, it gave a roadmap to the type of care that sickle cell disease patients really need. And then, uh, what I love about this program, and this is something that we do at the foundation quite a bit, is we'll do the proof of concept. We'll have a private funder or philanthropy that'll come in, we'll do the proof of concept, we'll get the data, and then that will be presented to Congress, and Congress will make a decision to, to either go to scale and fund it. So in this case, there's been additional funding that came from Congress to be able to take uh, this model of data collection, and uh, as an example in, in Los Angeles, it, they ended up creating a, a center for sickle cell disease management that had never existed because they, they realized it really needed to be uh, resourced in a way that had never been thought about, hadn't been designed in the right way, and it's, uh, it's been making a huge difference in the lives of the sickle cell 
uh, disease patients. So that's one example. We also did this with maternal uh, mor uh, mortality. Uh, the United States was seeing an increase in mothers dying uh, it, during childbirth or right after childbirth. So we did a, a, a model uh, program that proved that about 60% of these deaths could be avoided, could be prevented, and, and then that uh, Congress uh, ended up funding that to take to scale so that every state would be able to have a, a maternal uh, uh, mortality review to look at, at their own data and, and make a difference. Mention about dengue, dengue virus, and of course, uh, Florida's had some transmission of this, not, not you know, huge, but it's coming. Uh, I think this is uh, an example of, of course, climate change. We know that the mosquitoes, and they've done a lot of studies with the mosquitoes that carry dengue and Zika and some of the other, there are many, many diseases that are carried by mosquitoes worldwide. Um, but because of climate change and humidity and temperature changes, the mosquitoes are going farther north, they're going to more countries. Uh, dengue has uh, really spread around the world and has become a, a very serious uh, disease. This is just one project that we did through the foundation uh, in Guam uh, because they had their first uh, locally acquired case. Many, many times the cases, I know here in Florida, most of the cases are people that have traveled and they've, they've acquired dengue in another country and then they could travel back to Florida and then they get sick and get diagnosed. But uh, that local transmission uh, is more concerning all the time. And here in the United States, we're quite concerned about, uh, about the, the rise in dengue. Uh, but this happened to be in Guam. They had their first uh, locally acquired uh, case uh, in September of 2019. And so we, we were asked to come in um, and help with essential supplies to help protect the vulnerable population because the population, they, they'd never had it, so they needed education. They needed, uh, you know, insecticidal bed nets, as an example, uh, transportation of the bed nets. Many times some of our partners will be like UPS or FedEx, or so some of our uh, donations are in kind, or someone will transport for us what's needed. We might buy the bed nets, and then uh, a company will, will help uh, with that. Um, veteran suicide, I wanted to mention, of course, following the pandemic, uh, we all know mental, mental health is a major issue and touches so many lives. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, in this room have been touched either through your family or through uh, colleagues and friends. And, and veteran suicide is one that has been of great concern. Uh, we've been involved now with a project uh, to help uh, prevent uh, suicide in, in U.S. veterans for about three years now. It's stepping up. It's actually been a growing program. We're working with some of the veteran-serving organizations, so we'll, uh, we're able to fund them. And then we actually have two large programs coming up. Uh, I, I, was just, I actually just got an invitation to join the, the Surgeon General to speak uh, at a meeting uh, with the veteran-serving organizations about this topic. Um, so just to give you an idea of the, kind of the span of things that we do, uh, it's, it's infectious disease, it's injury, it's non-infectious, um, environmental, you, you name it. Um, and then, of course, the opioid, uh, uh, reducing opioid overdose. This is um, a, one of the stories I like to tell as well. So back um, a few years ago, there was funding from the federal government that went to all the health departments to be able to help with the opioid crisis. And the states went to CDC and they said, this is great that we're getting this funding, but we need staff and we can't hire them fast enough uh, because it takes time through government and, uh, and, and they, sometimes they'll have challenges uh, with the recruiting. So we were asked, could the CDC Foundation hire staff to help with the opioid crisis? It was 12 different states. Uh, we did that, um, and what we found was that um, we were quite successful. I think maybe because we have CDC in our name, so that helps. And we were able to recruit some uh, really quality uh, staff to be able to be embedded in the health departments. Then what uh, CDC was doing for the opioids was matching up public health with law enforcement. Um, but what happened is the two cultures uh, weren't the same, right? So there was a, a challenge with trying to bring public health into law enforcement and work together. So again, they asked the foundation, could we hire field staff to be able to work with law enforcement and put really an educational program and a support system in place? And that's, that's ongoing today and has been uh, a, a quite successful. So I, I guess all of this to say that because we're an independent nonprofit and, and we can be flexible. We can also be quite creative and, and move fast and just figure it out. I mean, so it's, and when folks bring us problems, we're like, okay, we'll, we'll try to figure that one out. 
Um, so that part's great fun. And then I'll end my formal comments when we can get into, hopefully have time for questions. Um, a little bit on data modernization. This is another high priority. Uh, it's a high priority for CDC and for our nation. Um, the, for the first comprehensive data modernization, modernization initiative for public health in the country is underway now. CDC is uh, leading this with some other agencies. Um, there are lots of data sources. And so the left side of this slide just depicts that. Lots and lots of data sources coming from laboratories, from hospitals, uh, cancer registries is an example. There are a number of registries, immunization registries, a whole host of information. Um, how do we capture that with the goal of having real-time data that can inform decision-making to help protect the public uh, from threats? And so that's really the, the, the gold standard to, to move forward with this. Technology today is so different than it was. I've, I can't tell you the number of people during the pandemic that I've spoken to. Uh, as an example, FinTech. I, I talked to a group of folks with uh, you know, financial technology, and they said, you know, if this had happened in 2010, our technology and uh, that we have available to us today would have been so much more disruptive in financial services than it is today. Um, I, I just, it's like one CEO with a company that, uh, after another that I speak to, they go, you know, if this had happened 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been there. 5G, you know, uh, just the fact that we've been able to do all the Zoom meetings and all the interconnectivity, we weren't there. Um, and so with today's technology and the, and the promise of advanced technology, uh, we should be able to realize this uh, for public health, which would be a game changer uh, to be able to have uh, the data in, all, in near real time or, or real time to be able to make those decisions and inform the public. So uh, the data standards, that box there, the federal government has set standards that go into effect in 2022. Uh, I won't get into all the technicalities there, the HL7 fire is what it's called, but everybody has to standardize. So public health is rallying now uh, to work with uh, hospital systems. And so example, uh, the other box there, the CDC Foundation, we're going to have uh, project uh, with Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. They've been doing a lot in this space with individual patients and data, but we need to go to population level. And so there's going to be uh, a lot happening in this uh, area. CDC's received a, a bit over a billion dollars to uh, put toward the data modernization as a starting point. Um, and I'll end on the, the iPhone there. Uh, one of the things worldwide that we're finding in many of our projects, particularly with Bloomberg Philanthropies, is using the iPhone as that data source, right? We all have our apps. That's where you get your information. You know where the vaccines are. You can send information uh, back, you know, uh, to CDC or, or where your health department. Um, so the iPhone is one of the game changers, obviously, in, in all of this data. Um, so that gives you, um, I could go on all day because we have projects <laughs> all over, but that, that hopefully that gives you an idea of kind of the span of work that we do at the CDC Foundation uh, in partnership with CDC and with our health departments and many, many partners. Um, and do we, we go to questions now? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Looks like we've got some questions lined up for you, Dr. Monroe. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you for the presentation. I heard that you have uh, partnerships in terms of funding. I also heard that you receive funds from donations through the year. Do y'all have an endowment that helps fund the annual budget? Boy, I sure wish so. We have a, we have a very small endowment. Um, uh, uh, what's interesting, the history of that is if you look at our legislation, there was a suggestion you know, or, or uh, talked about endowment. Um, we've Over the years, we've not built a very substantial endowment. That, that's a dream of mine. I would love to have that. But So most of our work is uh, case by case, uh, and, and most of our work is done donor directed, where the donors say we we want to fund this particular project. Um, so um, not not a lot of flexible funding that we make decisions on. Great question. Thanks for coming. You covered throughout your presentation the importance of accurate data, reliable, valid data. Could you drill down just a little bit about COVID-19 and where that stands right now? You said 2022 was a target date for some standards, but where do we stand now? Uh, because there, there, 
there are still some issues about the validity and reliability of information in various places, both in South Georgia and in Florida. Yeah, no, that's a terrific question. I, I can't say that I'm an expert on where we particularly stand, but it's it's a it, it's a real problem uh, because the, that's true. We we are not at a current state with our data systems where all the data is coming in as accurately or as timely as it should. Um, going back, you know, we had health departments when we started this um, pandemic that were using fax machines. I mean, they didn't, you know, they were receiving, uh, our small local health departments uh, have been under-resourced, I mean, public health at large. Um, this is, um, one of the things that excites me about data systems is that because of today's technology, we can reach, we can reach everyone uh, if it's designed properly. And, and so that's, that's really the challenge uh, in front of us. So, but you're right, that we're not, we're not there today. <laughs> okay, a couple of questions. Um, let, me, uh, let me share a couple of questions that I have. Um, how do you have people on staff that do constant research, Dr. Monroe, to keep you all abreast of some of the latest things that are happening? For example, you mentioned mosquitoes and dengue fever, but Florida just released a bunch of uh, sterile male mosquitoes to try to trick the female mosquitoes into keeping Zika from expanding. So are you aware of that? And are, are you taking some of those programs and maybe ex exporting them to other places? Yeah, no, that's a terrific question. So one of the advantages that we have at the CDC Foundation um, is, is the fact that we work so closely with CDC. So the Centers for Disease Control have experts that, that's, that's all they do is they, they're in laboratories with mosquitoes, right, and they're, they're as, as one example. So you have some of the world's top-notch scientists at CDC, and they're working with academic centers. So that's the other thing, too. So it's a whole network. It's not just CDC, but it's what our academic institutions bring as well. So we have the advantage at the CDC Foundation because of our relationships and knowing folks. I, I feel very privileged because I can pick up the phone and talk to those experts mm -hmm. and find out, uh, you know, answer questions and so forth. Um, and yes, uh, and the keys, right? They just yes. released those yes, the, the mosquitoes, uh, and uh, we'll see how that, that goes. But it's, uh, we've I will tell you, the experts at CDC are very concerned about mosquitoes uh, at large, uh, and also tick-borne uh, diseases too, because ticks are spreading uh, more as well. So there's intense uh, studies underway, and, and so then the short answer to your question is, if that's successful, one of the things that the foundation does is we'll use our communication channels uh, to help lift messages that are really important that others should do. Then we may have private funders that come in and say, you know, let's get this started in this community where there might not be federal or state money to start with. Um, and I, that really is our sweet spot. We're kind of the starter. We're, we're fire, fire starters. And then we get out of the way, right? I mean, then if there's sustainable funding uh, or another model, then, then we've done our work. We move to the next project. Great. Yeah. Uh, Doc? Thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. Uh, you started out talking about the importance of partnerships, and that's what's really allowed you to, to expand your region. Would you talk a little bit about which partnerships you find most valuable and which ones you would like to have in the future to be able to expand your region further? Well, that's a terrific question. So we, we do, we have such broad partnerships that it depends on the topic, which one is most valuable. Um, I'll start with businesses, I mean, because we, we do have a number of, and I mentioned the Health Action Alliance. Uh, we have partnerships with um, just about every type of business that you can imagine. So on the data modernization topic, as an example, we're very interested and we're talking to a number of, of uh, technology companies and uh, folks that are really advanced, right? I mean, because business will always be more advanced than government, if I can say that, right? Because that's what, you know, businesses are always pushing and they've got that, that opportunity. Um, we've got a lot to learn from them. So, so in the data modernization, there's a ton of information there. We are, one of the things we do at the foundation, uh, and we're going to be doing more of this, are listening sessions, because we, as an independent nonprofit, we can gather folks and, and really listen for where the wisdom is, where we should be thinking about things, and then put papers together uh, to inform you know, whether, whether government wishes to read that or other businesses and so forth. Um, one of the partnerships that's been great for us are other nonprofits. And so right now, we're involved with, um, there, there are a number of organizations around uh, the country. One is uh, through uh, George Washington University. 
and they, it's called the Funders Forum. And it's, it's like uh, conversion foundations and family foundations more at the state level uh, that come together, or you'll have like the Kellogg and Kresge and some of those foundations. The, many of these endowed foundations, now they're endowed, not unlike the CDC Foundation, those, those endowed foundations, um, it's amazing the thought leadership that comes from them. They're, they're curious, they can put funding toward uh, questions, and obviously they fund universities, they, and we fund, we fund actually a lot of universities too, so that's another partnership, our academic partners. Um, we've done actually quite a bit with a number of universities through COVID. Um, so it really depends on the topic, um, and then we seek the we either seek the partnerships or they may come to folks come to us with ideas. Uh, that happens all the time. They'll come and say, "Is this something the foundation might be interested in?" and and then we'll we'll figure out what that looks like. So, um, I have I have one more question for you, and it's really kind of a two part question. And that is, I'm sure that y'all are looking over the horizon at some cutting edge issues. Two of which come to mind. One is more immediate. And that is, um, are y'all looking or funding any efforts to try to help educate employers and employees about coming back into the workplace post-COVID? And number two, something that's really offbeat, but still, still a serious issue, and that is uh, Americans, but even people in other countries are not procreating at the rate that we need. Uh, I'm not sure what you do about that, but I'd just like to know if you're doing anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me start with that first question. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, helping folks you know, get back to normal, get back to school, get back to business, uh, the Health Action Alliance is doing part of that through that partnership. And we have done um, a, a variety of things. Actually, on the front end of the uh, last summer, about a year ago, um, I was able to pair up with uh, former Secretary of Health and Human Services, Mike Levitt, who was the governor of Utah. Um, and he's now got Levitt partners. And so we paired up and we actually did national webinars uh, to educate. We had, we had like uh, you know, the superintendents and the school boards. And so there was a, one series on schools. And then there was one for businesses, uh, reopening businesses. And we just, it's funny you'd ask that, because we were just saying we need to revisit maybe doing some of those types of, whether they be webinars or communications. Um, we, our, our foundation over the years has done a number of things that are products that are aimed toward businesses to translate the public health messaging. CDC, so CDC put out so much guidance, and they put out more, uh, they do the weekly uh, morbidity and mortality reviews. They, they publish more of those than ever during COVID, right? It's dense, though. If you go to the website, there is a lot of information. And so what we'll do is take that, lift it up, translate it, and put it into the, the language of business. We've had experts that will put it into the language that will help the businesses or help the educators. And so the short answer is yes. Um, I guess for the second question, we all, I, I think the answer to that is we need to get life back to normal. Uh, and if I, I will say, you know, uh, I, I will say, I, having been, been a physician, uh, working in science, um, uh, the, I, I continue to marvel at how effective the vaccines have been. I mean, that really was an amazing scientific breakthrough. And so that is our way forward to, to being able to have everybody be safe and, and uh, have children. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Let's give her a nice, warm, economic club welcome. You've been listening to Dr. Judy Monroe, MD, President and CEO of the CDC Foundation, speaking before the Economic Club of Florida on June 3rd, 2021 in Tallahassee, Florida. For more information on the CDC Foundation, visit cdcfoundation.org. The Economic Club of Florida promotes interest and enlightenment on important economic, political, and social issues of the day. To learn more, including how to become a member, visit our website at economic-club.com. This program was recorded at the Florida State University Alumni Center in Tallahassee, Florida.